Okay. Uh, sorry, the clock is wrong here. So I know. I was thinking the same thing, uh, we, that we still have time. So I'm going to call to order the regular meeting of the Temple City Unified School District Board of Education for Wednesday, February 8th, 2023. And we'll do roll call. I'm here. Mary Sneed. Here. Vincent Bell. Here. Matt Smith. Here. Melissa Espinosa. Here. Amir King, our student board member. Here. Item three is public comment on closed session agenda items. Does anybody have any public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to closed session, um, which is item number four, disclosure of items to be discussed in closed session. Uh, we have three uh, personnel matters, government code 54957, public employee appointment, discipline, dismissal, and release. Two, public employment uh public employee performance evaluation uh, for the superintendent, and that's government code 54957. And three, labor negotiations, government code 54957.6. It's an update, direction to district negotiators, Art Kuna, Connie Wu, and Juris Burgos for TCEA, CSEA 105, and CSEA 823, and management. Would someone like to make a motion to adjourn to closed session? I'll move. I'll second. Motion by Member Sneed, second by Member Espinosa. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, we are adjourned at 6.02.
Welcome, everyone. We'll uh, reconvene to open session. Um, would someone like to make a motion, please? So moved. Second. Motion by Member Smith, second by Member Bell. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries 5 0. We'll reconvene at 7 o'clock. Uh, announcement tonight's meeting is being digitally recorded. Um, next item is a Pledge of Allegiance, and it's going to be led tonight by Lauren Lee. And Lauren is an uh, AP Art Design student at Temple City High School. Uh, put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. Thank you, Lauren. Item 9 is announcement of actions taken in closed session, and there were none. Um, we'll move on to item 10, which is changes in the agenda. Does anyone have any changes? No changes. Changes? Okay, we'll approve the agenda then. Would someone like to make a motion? Move. Motion by Member Sneed. I'll second. Second by mem uh, Student Board Member King. Um, so preferential vote by our Student Board Member King. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries 5-0. Now to the fun part. Uh, item 12, which is our special recognitions presentations. And our first one is Lauren Lee. So who is going to be? Okay. Oh, you can, no, you're up here too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, before we get started, uh, I, I am going to have Lauren present uh, to all of you, but uh, her teacher, uh, Ms. Kim, could not be here today, and so she actually shared uh, some uh, words that I would like to read uh, on her behalf. Lauren Lee is my former student who was enrolled in AP Art and Design during the 21-22 academic year as a junior. She was an exemplary and one of the most dedicated students who demonstrated strong work, work ethic, willingness to go above and beyond, and consistently delivered high quality work. With the level of complexities in her inquiry development tied in with research, critical thinking, and personal experience of living in the midst of the pandemic, Lauren was able to, f to fully engage in all aspects of the most frightening and confusing time of her life as she fully submerged herself in all levels of behavior, emotional, and psychological impact of COVID-19 pandemic through the lens of a 16-year-old high school student. She further made the connection by using her immediate environment as a source of motivation and revealed the reality of the unsettled state of mind, fear, and loss, and uh, poignantly uh, captured all sta stages of human emotions caused by the ripple effect of the pandemic. Moreover, she successfully navigated this journey by engaging the viewers as active participants as we all have experienced and lived through the sheer devastation and despair of the COVID-19 pandemic. During the entire process of creating her inquiry based sustained investigation, Lauren took a proactive approach in asking questions, exploring all possibilities, practicing, experimenting, revising her work, and completely engaged in the art making process with the communication line open for continuous dialogue. Being diligent, meeting high expectations, and delivering exemplary work in the span of two weeks can be overwhelming and quite exhausting, but Lauren always prioritized and performed to her best ability to deliver exemplary work. And this is why we are here for Lauren today. Uh, Ms. Uh, Kim says, I am very proud of Lauren as she is one of the 49th student artist from six countries selected from more than 62,000 portfolios submitted to the 2022 AP Art and Design exam to be featured in the 2022 AP Art and Design dig uh, digital exhibit. This is a great honor as the exhibit will showcase the rigor and excellence of the AP Art and Design portfolios and be used as an exemplary teaching tool shared with AP Art and Design students worldwide. Lastly, I would like to thank the board for inviting 
uh, us both and giving Lauren the opportunity to share her portfolio tonight. So with that, I will turn it over to you. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, as you know, my name is Lauren, and I'm a senior in high school. Uh, I have a sister in college whom I'm close to that has inspired me to take the artistic path in life, as well as supportive parents of my aspirations. I'm aiming to pursue illustration in the future and dream of making stories through art. So uh, for my sustained investigations portfolio, I inquired into how COVID-19 has impacted students' lives, whether it be at school or in their home environment. I aspire to capture the psychological effects that students have been experiencing as a result of the pandemic, and also focus on the isolation felt by many returning to school through a series of realistic but stylized visuals. Uh, at the start from my sustained investigation one through eight, I focused on showing the way students behave in school after quarantine, as well as the distance that has developed among students since the pandemic. From SI 9 to 14, I shifted the environment from school to people's homes to focus on how COVID has impacted the way students act in their own house, an environment that is a supposed refuge, and how it has altered relationships with their families. For my last SI, I wanted to show a personal lesson that I've learned from my own experience during COVID. Uh, Through all of my pieces, I used digital art and consistently emphasized perspective and tested developing my own distinct art style. Uh, I'll be showing you a couple of pieces from my portfolio. So this is the first one I did, actually. And I was trying to show the exhaustion felt by many students as they begin school again in person. Uh, for this piece, I tried to display the anxiety and pressure that students were feeling from public speaking during class. Uh, so this art piece, I tried to capture the many students' paranoia of staying clean and fear of becoming infected during the pandemic. For this piece, I tried to portray the overwhelming stress of coming back to school and re-entering the classroom setting. I also tried to show students' feeling of depression and anxiety that go by unnoticed despite many schools' attempts at lifting morale. Uh, I'm not sure if you could see, but there's like some graffiti that is like in the dark that show like the students' cries for help that are less seen. They're also sticking out with positive like sayings or phrases that are more shown in the light, and that is a representation of my ideas essentially. This one is depicting the declining motivation of students coming back from quarantine as well as the lack of effect or even the lowering of morale of students from school's motivational posters. For this one, this depicts the aftermath of getting addicted to technology during quarantine, and as a result can lead to neglecting and going isolated from family. Uh, this piece shows how the consequences of alcoholism during quarantine can impact family relationships. And this piece uh, portrays the fear and anxiety of losing loved ones to COVID. This is my last piece, which captures the importance of reaching out to family and help during stressful times. Uh, that is it. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're very proud of you, and um, I hope you will uh, let us know how we can view this online. Um, I think it would be really interesting. Congratulations to you. We have a certificate. That's for you, and we'd like to do a picture if we could. Okay, come on over here.
Okay, next we're going to recognize the piece, uh, our students from the Temple City Unified School District that were chosen to um, participate on the PCC Tournament of Roses Honor Band. And Mr. Taylor, is that why you're here to speak to it? You, is that why you walked forward? <laughs> So uh, what is the Catholic New College Turner Road Honor Band? I'd like to kind of fill everybody in on this, but sometimes people don't know what that is. We have at Catholic New College about 70 uh, college students. Every October we have about 500 uh, students from far away in uh, Alpha Valley and as far north as Missouri come to audition for the band. Uh, only 123 out of the 500 were selected this year. Um, 13 of the city high school students were selected and accepted into the band, which I am proud to say was the most of any high school in the <laughs> Um We begin rehearsals on the first Sunday of November. They rehearse for a minimum of six hours. Color guards sometimes rehearse all day. Uh, and we go every Sunday of November with the exception of the weekend of Thanksgiving. Marching rehearsals begin in mid uh, December, and uh, they're pretty much all day rehearsals. And we rehearse every single day of our holiday break uh, until the parade, of course. Um, so they're very busy that way uh, rehearsing. A little few stats. There's only 16 rehearsals leading up to the parade, 16 rehearsals to get ready for this parade. Um, but in that 16 rehearsals, there was over 113 hours, give or take, color guard and percussion are there for a few more than that, so it might be more than 120. Um, and we marched and covered over 40 miles in the rehearsal time in that 16 rehearsals, so we did a lot. As you can see, we rehearsed a lot of times at Plaza Stadium, at Pride, the Outer Rim, and just marched around and around. <laughs> um, on January 2nd, we get to perform for over 400 
want to thank you too, Mr. Taylor, um, because I know, uh, I'm sure you uh, personally inspire these students to apply, and um, thank you so much. And when I, I want to say really quick, we are so excited that these two are here, Ms. Kidd and Ms. Mr. Cordero, thank you for having such a great program that these kids are able to do this. Mm-hmm. So When I watched it on TV, I didn't know which ones were our students, but I knew you were out there somewhere, and I was so proud of you. Uh, We have certificates for you. Uh, First, uh, Julia Yamasaki. Mandy Wu. Megan Wang. Jessica Reyes. Jackie Reyes. Amanda Nguyen. Jackson Kidd, <laughs> you look like everyone. <laughs> uh, Jamie Hahn, <laughs> Joseph Cooper. Amanda Chang. Okay, we're going to get a picture. One more recognition, and this is kind of along the same lines, but we're going to recognize the Temple City High School band leaders. And do we have someone who's going to speak to this? Not prepared to speak tonight, but I would like to uh, recognize uh, our student leadership and uh, 
the students of Temple City uh, music program, the POTC, and the Color Guard. Um, we had a rough start last year, and we went out and made semifinals, and this year we made it all the way to championships. Out of 400 bands, we placed 14, wow, and the Color great. Guard took uh, seventh overall. Wow. So, uh, It's an honor to uh, be one of the leaders of the program, along with Mr. Bailey and Mrs. Kidd, and um, just a, a wonderful district to work for. And really enjoying the students and being part of the program. So thank you. Yes, and so let's uh, get our student leadership up here. We have our senior and junior drum major, Kaylee and Josh. Amanda for <laughs> and for drumline we have Samantha who is our front ensemble. Amanda who's also in our front ensemble. Um, and oh, I feel really short. Um, so then we have our captains, uh, Mandy Wu and Jackie Reyes. I have our um, Saber Sergeant, Saber Sergeant, I just realized the team is not here, um, Julia Yamasaki, my PR team, which I would die without, and I know that you're like, what, your PR team is here? And yes, they are, because they're like, I couldn't do it. Those videos are hard to edit. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I have Jamie Han and Corinne Moy. And I'm grateful for all of them. And one of the things I think that Reggie didn't mention is that these kids gave up so much time and so much of their lives in the fall. Um, they live on campus. They, I can't tell you how many times we had to sit because of the heat and watch our like cell phones just waiting for the temperature to drop and for the sun to be like out of the sky to be like, okay, take the field. We have an hour. Go, go, go. The football team's gone. Um, so they really, 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 it's a testament to them and how hard they work that we were able to make it as far. And we're very grateful for all of them. Well, I think the, the uh, name Pride of Temple City is so fitting because we're so proud of you guys. Everything you do, you make Temple City High School proud. Um, I have some certificates, but I understand we're short a few, so don't worry. We will get you. If you didn't get one tonight, we'll get you one, okay? Um, Samantha Lee. <laughs> Emily Sanchez. She's not here? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Corrine Moy. Jackie Reyes. <laughs> Kaylee Iber, or I Iber. <laughs> and Josh Sue. <laughs> and I know Josh because he's the captain of Science Olympiad. Right? <laughs> okay, we're going to, I know he is, boy, talk about being able to multitask. Okay, we're going to take a picture.
Uh, before we move on, I just want to make a little announcement. Our girls' soccer team is playing a CIF game right now, and they're up 3-1. to one. So let's keep those good thoughts going. And Elena said she'll let me know what the final is. Okay, we'll move on to item 13, which is public comment on agendized and non-agendized items. Uh, do we have any, Marie? No? Is there anyone who wanted to speak? Okay, we'll move on to item 14, which is the community update. This Saturday, February 11th, is the coronation of the Royal Court for the 2023 Camellia Festival. The event will be held at Live Oak Park and will begin at 7 p.m. Uh, former Royal Court members are encouraged to attend to be introduced. Speaking of the Camellia Festival, the Camellia Festival is February 24th through the 26th. The parade featuring the Pride of Temple City uh, will be held on February 25th at 10 a.m. Pre-sale tickets and wristbands can be purchased online at thefuncarnival.com or in person at City Hall or Live Oak Park. And this year only, parents, there is a great deal on pre-sale tickets, so don't miss out. They're switching, they're changing their system of tickets. And so they're trying to get rid of their old ones, and they're selling them cheap. Founders Day will be held on Saturday, February 18th, 6 p.m. at Live Oak Park. Registration, res reservations will be accepted at the school sites until this Friday. Uh, don't miss out on the opportunity to honor the staff and community volunteers who make our district so successful. Tickets are also on sale for this year's musical, which is High School Musical. And they can be purchased online at tchs.seatyourself.biz. For those of you that are interested in local history, the Homestead Museum and Industry will have a talk on a memorial to the Pioneer Temple family. And it will be on Sunday, February 19th at 2 p.m. Um, also, um, I mentioned the girls' soccer team, but positive thoughts for our girls' basketball team, which plays tomorrow, and our girls' water polo team, which plays tomorrow also, and that will be a second round for them. And the State of the City will be held on February 28th at 6 p.m. at the Women's Club Hall. Um, Mayor Sternquist is going to speak on the future of the past. And RSVPs are due by February 20th. And last but not least, a big thank you to our school counselors. This is School Counselor Recognition or Appreciation Week. Um, this week we are honoring those people who dedicate themselves to ensuring that the educational, social, and emotional needs of our students are met. And we couldn't do it without them. So thank you to our school counselors. And that is all I have for the community update. Um, moving on, we'll do this district updates, and we'll start with business services. Connie Wu. Yes, good evening, Board of President Judge you know, Board of Education, Superintendent Dr. Kuna, Executive staff, and community members. It is a time of the year that uh, Western Global JP released the uh, information for next year's insurance premium renewal from the property liability, cyber insurance, and works comp. There will be up to 40% increase. So for sure, the district will pay more for premium, in, um, pre premium in insurance for next year. Today, uh, one of our customers, an emperor, um, smells like a gas. It turned out the bad um, capacitor on the HVAC caused the bad smells. The broken parts has uh, been replaced, and we thank Principal Maya for for being preactive to remove, remove the students and communic with, communicating with the district office immediately. And we also thank Anthony and his team was on the side and timely to address and fix the problem. The staff and the student safety is, all, is always our top priority. In an effort to improve students' meal offering, the food service department has replaced some of unpopular items on the menu of ele elementary school, replaced by chicken sandwich, beef, beef and uh, cheese, pasta, teriyaki chicken. Sounds great. <laughs> and we are continue working on the plan for the secondary school. The department will continue seeking important feedback from the students and the communities. 
The facility admins department is planning on the facility project for spring break. Here's the list as of right now. We're going to work on the oak multi-building roof, uh, roof rehabilitation, the clever drainage issue in the front of the campus as well in the, in the campus. And uh, we were doing some work at district office, hallway, energy saving, sensor light and mitigation. And of, of course, the next project is the Oak Avenue safety and uh, access control, which project we will present tonight, later on. So that's the end of my presentation, of my report. Thank you. Uh, next, educational services, Richard Lohman. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> no pressure, yeah. Good evening, everyone. I just want to echo what Mr. Loman had said. I really want to thank everybody. I mean, everybody. Certificated, classified, admin, board, all the stakeholders. Um, we're here for one reason, it's for our kiddos, it's for our students, and uh, we cannot lose focus on that. Um, and with that, shout out to our counselors for all that they do. And I have nothing else to update, it's hard to follow, but um, yes, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Next we'll move on to our bargaining unit, um, TCEA, shall we? Welcome. Good evening. Um, I wanted to take a moment to recap how things have been going for us. Um, when we began negotiations in December, we felt very positive. We felt that it was collaborative and that everyone was working together toward a common goal. It should be noted that our hope and goal was always to finish before winter break. Our members are struggling to make ends meet with costs of everything on the rise, and we wanted to get money into their paychecks as soon as possible. 
For various reasons, the timeline we had hoped for was not possible. We were willing to be understanding of this and be patient. We came back to the table last week, almost two months after our first session. We had a couple of priorities in mind, salary being the main one. What we were presented with in terms of salary was not what we were hoping for. We felt there was no way to take that number to our members and also felt that the district was not willing to discuss any further options. It was at that time that we got our members involved, which you likely saw and or heard about on Monday morning. At this time, we have been able to reopen talks with the district and have two dates scheduled in the next two weeks. So tonight I'm asking for the following considerations. First, please consider the rising costs we are all facing. Consider the number of our members who have to work multiple jobs just to make ends meet. Consider the increase in demands on us over the past couple of years. TCEA gets emails daily from members who are growing more and more frustrated with the severe behavior problems in their classrooms. The increased demands as we try to make up for the learning loss that occurred as a result of the pandemic and the increased problems with the mental toll that all of this takes, not only on our students, but us as well. Many people are questioning whether teaching is something that they can continue, both because of all of these demands and because they simply cannot afford to continue. It is the hope of our executive board and our bargaining team to continue negotiating in good faith. We need transparency and trust to make this happen. Over the last several years with past administrations, those things were not present, or at least our members felt like they were not. While I personally believe that they are returning and now exist again, a large majority of our members are not there yet. I look forward to being back at the bargaining table next week and ultimately being able to go to our members with a fair agreement that shows that our work and commitment to TCUSD are valued. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is CSCA 105, Robin. Okay, um, CSCA uh, 823, Art. Okay. <laughs> okay, next um, we'll move on to board member comments. And tonight we're going to start with Member Smith. Okay, thank you, Donna. Um, it's been a busy couple of weeks since we got together last. I uh, had a chance to uh, visit with um, Teresa Huang and the uh, ELD students on the 26th, and they uh, celebrated their Lunar New Year celebration and had a little learning activities. And anyway, I appreciated the invitation. I thought it went really well. I also had a chance to attend the uh, Performing Arts at the San Gabriel Civic on the 27th. It was an excellent show. Um, then the next day was the uh, Science Olympiad at the high school. And I was there for most of the day. I snuck out for about an hour or so, but it was a really nice. It was nice to understand what exactly goes on there. It's much more than I thought. Um, on the 30th, I attended a, a Dennis Wolver and Kelly. It's the district the, the attorneys for our district. Uh, they had a Brown Act survival guide, and uh, it was a Zoom meeting. I saw at one point they had 274 people on, so it was quite big. But they covered a lot of good material, and they did it nicely. So. Um, Let's see, on the, on the uh, fourth, I had a chance to attend the City of Temple City Lunar New Year celebration. That was fantastic. I really enjoyed watching the dragon dance and the lions and whatnot. And then there was other activities and kids singing and whatnot, so that's nice. On the eighth, um, well, that's today. <laughs> uh, we, had, we were, as a number of us, well, we were all invited to attend the signing ceremony at the high school for a couple of our water polo uh, athletes, uh, which, which were Miles Chang and Andrew Jones. Uh, and then um, Don already mentioned F Founders Day, so uh, next week is uh, Valentine's Day. I hope everybody has a wonderful Valentine's Day. That's it. Thank you. All right, after you is Member Snead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to wish all the counselors a happy school counselors week, and I want to thank them for all they do for our students. Uh, congratulations to uh, Kevin Slattery and Board Member Bell. Uh, for all the great work you did with our science Olympiad team. I unfortunately had a prior engagements for part of that day, but I was able to see uh, some of it, and uh, we sat there and watched the flight competition and kept waiting 
first to hit the fan and it hit him and it missed it, but he, they won that one. Uh, but uh, I want to thank you for um, helping coach the students, giving them uh, the run of your garage for all these months to prepare. Uh, they came in six out of over 70 teams, not just outstanding. And I understand they're going to Berkeley this weekend for the next competition. So thank you for working with the Bird SO Tour to bring them to the campus. Um, last week I attended the presentation of the uh, NGSS materials. Um, it was great to see grade level representatives, but also there was, there was a parent there. And then the um, secondary teachers came in for their um, but everybody was very excited by to see the presentation from these different uh, published publishers, and uh, it, it'll be nice when all those materials get updated. It's been a lot of years. We're really due for a, uh, for an update on our science materials, so it'll be interesting to see which ones they choose, and then see them in action once they start piloting them in the classroom. Uh, several of us attended the dance concert, another great show, uh, just a wonderful showcase of our performing arts. Um, I also attended the signing event at the high school, so congratulations to the two uh, water polo athletes, and I wish them a lot of, I hope they have a great career in college. One is going to Pomona, the other one is going to Merced, so they're going in different directions, but I hope they have a great career. Um, Lauren Lee's ta uh, talent that she showed this evening, my, my goodness, just, she just got moved just by what, just by looking at her work. It's amazing how much she can put into a picture and just to really show what the students have gone through in the last, last two years. And I, she's, she has a great career ahead of her. Um, as a former band booster and band mom, um, I was glad that we were able to, um, celebrate the great season of the Pride of Temple City, and I'll mirror what uh, President Giorgino said they are. We are very proud. Temple City is very proud of them. Um, and also all the band and auxiliary members um, who are part of the PCC Honor Band. Um, they really brought a lot of pride. I I always try to, I try to watch Channel 5 so I can see the bands. I usually talk over the bands, so it was nice to see it tonight without any conflict conversation over the bands and see the great work they did. Um, looking forward to the Camellia Fest, uh, looking forward to seeing the band, our band in the, being the host band for the Camellia Festival in a couple of weeks. And finally, I'm excited tonight that we're approving um, the three courses that were offered last at our last meeting that were explained. And they're going to be great additions to our our curriculum and going to meet the needs of so many of our students. So I'm just really excited that the next step is happening tonight so we can approve those and get the kids taking those classes as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, I'm next. Um, I have participated in the Brown Act training also. On February 28th, the state of emergency in California will end and modifications to the Brown Act that were enabled at the start of the pandemic will uh, cease. Um, there are some new procedures that will go into effect until January 1st, 2026, so uh, the public will see, uh, some, won't be seeing the Zoom meetings like they used to, but um, there may be some uh, things that we do a little bit differently. I stopped by the district office uh, a couple weeks ago to observe the presentations of the uh, NGSS committee by the publishers. And thank you to Amy Gerling and Scott uh, Sherman for the invitation and for organizing the event. And I look forward to hearing uh, the committee's conclusions. I really enjoyed this year's dance concert. It was the first one since 2020, and I think... Uh, they took three years worth of energy and creativity and put it all together because it was a great concert. Um, congratulations to everyone who was involved. I also attended the ELD Mentor Program a Lunar New Year event at Temple City High School. And thank you to Teresa Wong for her continuing commitment to our ELD students. Um, congratulations to Bella Villalobos, who has signed to attend Cal State San Bernardino on a soccer scholarship. Um, Miles Chang, who signed to play water polo at Pomona College. 
and Andrew Jones, who signed to play water polo at UC Merced. And thank you to Ramrodders for conducting the signing ceremonies for these three students. It's very exciting. Finally, I attended the Science Olympiad Tournament at TCHS on January 28th. Um, thank you to PTA, Grad Night, and our Science Olympiad teams from Oak, Longden, and Emperor for providing concessions for the event. Also, thank you to our staff that worked the event. Um, I walked around and uh, talked to a lot of the different teams, and time and time again, I kept hearing, uh, your people that work here are so nice. Your campus is so clean. It's so well-maintained. Um, they're mostly talking about our classified staff. So please pass the word because I heard it time and time again. People kept telling me that. And uh, they're right. The place looked beautiful. So thank you so much. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> um, a special thank you to Kevin Slattery, who has been the advisor for the Science Olympiad team for 25 years. Um, that's dedication. and and he symbolizes the type of people that make Temple City what it is. Um, thank you also to our superintendent. Um, there's a direct line between your leadership and the support of the Science Olympiad program and the success of the event, and uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, and also, big thank you to this guy right here, Vincent Bell. He likes to be in the background and not take credit for anything, but he has donated many, many years uh, to the Science Olympiad program, and he's even donated his garage to the students, and he's helped bring um, excellence to um, the program, so thank you so much. And finally, thank you to our students. <laughs> they are amazing and have brought a lot of positive recognition to our school district, and as we mentioned before, they placed six out of over 70 teams, and I couldn't be more proud of them. So thank you to them. Next is um, Member Bell. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to start off by uh, congratulating our uh, recognition niece today. I, I'm not sure that's the right word. Uh, but uh, Lauren Lee, sometimes I'll pass it through the high school and walk through the hallway, and I'll see the artwork that's um, showcased there, and it's phenomenal. I want everyone to know that during my time at the high school, I was an art major, and I know I'm doing science today. Um, <laughs> strange how our life takes you. Um, however, um, I will say that uh, my uh, art teacher, both at Oak and at the high school, had a great influence in the direction of my career and uh, in, in my growth as a person as well. So, Mr. Dick Kalicki and Ms. Dunn, they're both amazing, amazing individuals. And, you know, I will never forget them in my life. And as I'm sure, and I want to recognize, I don't know who Lauren's teacher was, but thank you for inspiring kids like her uh, to do these great things. Um, and uh, also want to, again, uh, say my appreciation for the honor band students. It is a lot of work. There is a lot of driving, even for me, because I had an experience with this when my daughter was taking part in this. So outstanding work. It's, it's such an honor for so many of our kids to be a part of something so prestigious. And it's such a, a great personal experience. It's once in a lifetime, almost. For some of them, it's twice. Um, and our band leaders for a wonderful year. So um, school counselors, can't say enough thank yous to all of you. We need you now more than ever. And I think everybody in this room knows that. Um, so thank you. Uh, the dance concert was amazing as always. Uh, Jenny Powell, for many years, just like uh, Jenny Slattery, has been the rock for that choreo team. I always enjoy that concert. It's so much fun. Uh, and uh, I don't know if it's because watching, you know, the boys being forced to do something. And the, Well, okay, I'll tell you what. The dancing with the teachers, I, I will never uh. want to miss that. that. That is the best, I mean, in my opinion. So, um, And uh, it's nice because this year the uh, choreo captains chose to bring back some of the alumni to do a piece, and I thought that was really touching um, in, in honor of the community that we have. So... Um, yeah, we had a busy day, 
that one Saturday when we had about 78 teams here. I, again, you know, a lot of it's already been said, so I don't want to repeat it, but again, I just want to show this, like, incredible appreciation for everybody who was involved, who volunteered their time uh, to help put Temple City on such a positive light uh, with not just the organization, but all the teams. And we took the time, we talked to a lot of teams. They were so appreciative that we were hosting to give these kids an opportunity to be in person, to get together again, to do the things that they love. And, and at the core of it, that is the most important thing. Um, and, uh, you know, we hope that this is something that we can grow and continue down the road. Uh, our PTA groups and everybody else, I think they saw what we are in Temple City and the strength that we have, and, and, and I'm so, so glad about that. Uh, and speaking of that team, um, you know, I had the opportunity to join in with Mr. Lesson there because five members of our active Science Olympiad team uh, since the fall of last year was very interested in creating their own science outreach program. Uh, and bringing it back to Oak Avenue to get prospective uh, students to take part in extracurricular uh, science-y stuff after school. And uh, they met with Mr. Lesson last week, and we had a great conversation. They had a plan, and, you know, we're hoping that perhaps in another week they would get up and running. They do have some students sign up. So I can't think of a, a greater example of how education is 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 such a big part of what we do and how we're influencing our kids today, hoping that some of these kids will be future educators would be a wonderful, wonderful thing for our society. Um, and uh, yes, there's so many things to go on, but um, yes, we are heading out to uh, the Berkeley campus this weekend. Our high school team is competing at the uh, Golden Gate Science Olympiad. Um, it's gonna be a lot of fun. It's gonna be a wonderful experience and uh, our team continues to grow, and I couldn't be more prouder of them. And then Founders Day, Camellia Parade, it's you know a reminder of who we are, and I look forward to taking part in all of those as well. So thank you so much, and that's what I have for today. Thank you, and Member Espinosa. All right, good evening everybody. Uh, I wanted to start by recognizing Black History Month. I, I want to acknowledge the struggles and the fight for human and civil rights for all black Americans. Um, and I also want to thank those principals that um, have, um, you know, headed up some, some recognition and some celebrations um, related to Black History Month. Um, I did see Myra Rodell's video and um, her, her reading of that poem by Langston Hughes. Um, I appreciate that, and I think um, it, it makes our students um, just better students to know the struggles, the fights, and the contributions of people of color, of everybody that makes up our, our community. So thank you so much. Uh, I also want to recognize Counselor Appreciation Week. Thank you, counselors, for all you do. Your work is vital, and it makes a difference to all of our students. So thank you so much. Um, and what a great night for the arts tonight here, right? Um, we had Lauren Lee. Her work is impactful. Um, I looked, that's the first time I had seen it and loved it, um, and she is amazing. Um, and I'm so glad that she is um, pursuing the arts. I think in some cases uh, there are thoughts that, you know, the arts do not pay the bills, and I think that there is a way to do what you love and be able to make a living doing it. I think that's, you know, the goal in your life is to, to do something that makes you happy, and in some cases it is the arts. So. Um, when there is a will, there is a way. So um, I really applaud students um, who look at that as, as, as a future that is possible and want to encourage the arts for, for many, many reasons, but that's one. Um, also, Honor Band and the Pride of Temple City, wow. Uh, these are kids that we have wanted to have come and visit us for a really long time, but they are so, so busy. And um, we were, I was just so excited to have them here today. Um, thank you and congratulations on such a wonderful season. Um, and thank you to the advisors for their hard work and their dedication. And the parents. Um, I am friends with some band moms and, um, and some band booster um, parents. And it is a, almost like a second job um, making sure that that team has what they need and to, to do as much as they 
as they have to do. Um, and to get the results, it's only because of the support from all of these sources um, that make them, uh, you know, and their hard work that make them so successful. So we are very lucky in this district to have some dedicated advisors and dedicated parents. And so I thank them all and um, want to applaud um, our students for their just their wonderful season. Um, in terms of attendance, I served as a chaperone for dance rehearsals at the Mission Playhouse on the 26th. Uh, I always like serving as a chaperone at those events because you get to see how the kids are, are preparing and interacting with one another, the camaraderie, the excitement. Um, it's, it's wonderful to see backstage. Um, so if you have a chance to chaperone, you know, I would encourage it. You just see a different perspective. On the 27th, um, I attended the dance concert, which was definitely fantastic. Um, one of my favorite shows to, to always see. Uh, on the 28th uh, of January, I attended the Science Olympiad event. It was well attended. Um, so many students from around California, and I think some outside of California, from Washington State, right? Um, and they, they, they had, um, we, at the uh, award ceremony, they had uh, some of the students who had already graduated that had contributed to the events, giving content for the events, tests, and um, and, and things that the kids were having to compete against each other with. And they were so, so excited. These were the kids that didn't get to go to uh, an in-person science Olympiad because of COVID-19. And they were just as excited as everybody in the stands that were receiving awards. And it was really great to see that. Um, and then we have uh, Founders Day. Um, I attended the Founders Day planning meeting that was on the 30th and looking forward to that event. Uh, very much. I know that PTA is working really hard and, um, and they're very thoughtful about this particular event and it's so appreciated. So thank you, PTA. That's it for me. Thank you. Next we'll move on to board member, oh, student board member comments. Um, to start off, I just wanted to echo um, board member Espinosa's comment on a happy Black History Month. Um, we are a school district, we are about learning, and I'd encourage everyone to just learn more about, once again, the contributions, the history, and the struggles of African Americans in this country. And even in California, we have a lot of deep history here. Um, with that said, I also wanted to wish our counselors a happy School Counselors Week. Um, at ESD, we surprised them with donuts and Starbucks this morning, and we decorated their offices, and it was really cute. Um, and I think that it's really ironic that we're celebrating it this week as we've just opened up course selections for the next year, which is going to be a whole other workload for them. Um, so there's some irony there. Um, I also wanted to congratulate Science Olympiad for all of their accomplishments. Thank you, Mr. Bell, Mr. Flattery, and all of the students who were really working overtime. Um, I have friends on Science Olympiad that were talking about how much sleep they got <laughs> preparing for that weekend, um, which isn't new for students, but it is really dedication that they're willing to sacrifice all that. Um, we've also had various senior nights for athletics, whether it be girls basketball or water polo and more, and we've been pairing that with ASB hosting coronations of like candy crowns during break, which is really awesome. We get a really nice crowd and we're able to honor our student athletes. Um, furthermore, I wanted to come commend um, Pride of Temple City, whether it's Color Guard Band, they also put in so, so much work, and they're always active in all of our activities as well. So a great example would be um, recently we had our Winter Rally and Freshman Showcase, and they performed at both of those events. They always do an excellent job of hyping the crowd up and showcasing what our performing arts is all about. Um, with the Freshman Showcase, we had a really awesome crowd. We get to some really excited incoming freshmen, so we were hyped about that. And as well as ASB, we had our winter formal at the high school. It was inside, so it wasn't freezing like last time. Um, but it was also a really great event as well. And then I wanted to highlight something as well, which is um, thank you to Food Services. They came and spoke to our um, Temple City High School ASB, I believe like a week, two weeks ago and really helped us students understand what was going on with the district. And they took feedback as well. So in terms of the sharing station, they brought that back to our campus. A lot of students have been using it. Um, 
personally myself, you know, I drop off like the raisins that I don't want to eat and I pick up the apples that somebody else doesn't want to. Um, so it's been a huge success and I'm just really grateful for our district as always. Thank you. Thank you. Um, quick announcement, girls soccer won three to one, so they'll be going on to round two. And uh, well, I guess we'll find out probably tomorrow what, when, when and where the game will be. Okay, so next we have our superintendent's comments. Thank you. Uh, actually, the game will be here on Friday. Yeah, yes. Um, I, don't, I don't know what time. Uh, it'll be either three or five. So. Um, going last, I, I, uh, so many people shared what I was going to say. So I will not repeat it, but I will say that I agree with uh, everything that was shared. A couple of things that I would like to uh, also call out. Um, as our winter sports uh, uh, season is coming to, or the regular season coming to a close, uh, I would like to congratulate all of our student athletes uh, who played winter sports, and I look forward to our spring sports beginning. Um, I also want to share that uh, if you have taken a look lately at the district website, uh, we have made some uh, adjustments to the district calendar. And when I say we, I mean Andy Harper uh, has made some <laughs> adjustments to the calendar. And so now it uh, is populating almost all of the schools. We're still working a, a few bugs out. But uh, uh, you'll notice that on the calendar it is um, most of the school side events are uh, listed there with the logo of the school next to the event. Um, so uh, we, we will continue to make progress in, in that area. Uh, once we get all of the schools up there. Um, yesterday, I don't know if you had heard or seen, uh, but there was, uh, and I don't even know who the group was, but um, law enforcement was bombarded with uh, numerous hoax phone calls regarding uh, safety and issues at uh, various school sites across the country. Uh, Duarte High School actually received a, a bomb threat call, uh, and so... Even though it was a hoax, um, there were still more than 30 units that, that showed up over at Duarte High School. So the one thing I take from it is I appreciate the, 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 uh, how, how law enforcement uh, reacted to the calls, and I, and I feel safer knowing that you know, should something happen here, we would get the same type of uh, turnout from law enforcement. But it's unfortunate that people make these calls, and we, we did not receive any of these calls at our schools, but uh, just wanted to make sure that the community was aware that that, that took place yesterday. Um, I also would like to uh, talk about uh, Science Olympiad for a couple of reasons. I was very proud that we were able to host the event, uh, not only to showcase our schools and our district, um, but also to provide our students with an opportunity not to travel. Uh, these events are usually not close, and for them to be able to have something in their own backyard, I think it did them well, and it's something that I think they can be proud of, too. Um, and I know it was stated that um, uh, there were thank yous from PTA, but I, I don't think we can state enough how thankful we are for PTA for what they did at Science Olympiad. Um, we were talking about individuals who were there from 6 in the morning until probably 8 in the evening. Um, all day, missing events for, for their own children as well uh, to support our students at Science Olympiad and to, to support the district. And, and it wasn't just that day, right? Like the coordination that goes into this, the uh, picking up of, of um, you know, food and drinks and everything else. Uh, one of our PTA members is here, Maria Garner, thank you, um, because we could not do any of this without the support of our, our, our volunteers. And I will implore, uh, if anybody is listening, to also volunteer. Um, because when I go to events, and when we all go to events, and, and we go to many of them, we see the same volunteers. And so if we, we could help out and, and uh, not burn out so many of our parents, uh, that would be really helpful. and, and uh, it just goes to show the, the dedication of our parents. So thank you. Uh, and if we can in, increase the level of our, our volunteerism, I think everybody would appreciate that. And that is all I have for tonight. Thank you. 
Uh, number 20 is written communications. I don't have any. Does anyone else? Okay. Then we'll move on to our discussion information items. And the first one is dual enrollment presentation by Richard Lullman. And I am so excited. Before I begin. If they wanted to take um, a higher level math class that we don't offer at the school, that's not going to count for their math requirements, then by all means they could do that. And so the non-CAP is very flexible in what they could take. It's any student could take any class there. There are some restrictions on PE. Um, and then the CAP classes, it's much more restricted, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the one on the very end, and it I could be honest and say that one was stressing me out because I didn't have a good grasp of what middle college and early college high schools were. And so before I came down, I'm like scrambling, I'm Googling it basically, like what are these? And so really it's a different way of looking at it. And so the commitment from Ed Code is there are some places that traditional schools have not been effective. And this is that opportunity to, to merge community colleges and high schools closer together closer than what we are. Um, and then within those schools, there's a lot of flexibility. There's internships and there's mentorships um, and the schedule has changed. So so whereas Temple City is very traditional, these schools would not be seen as very traditional. And then there's the legislation. So before we had Ed Code, now we have legislation. And the parts that are, are bold, those are really the, I think I feel are the highlights that come out of that. So AB 30, which replaced an older version of um, legislation, it really focuses on access for our underrepresented students. And so they make that commitment for our underrepresented students. Um, SB, so Senate Bill 554 is for our adult school students, so those who are working towards a high school diploma, it grants them access. And then AB 102, um, it really allows the, the MOU CAP classes that partnership to go on indefinitely, there's no time frame for it. And so with that one, whereas there was something that had to be renewed by the, the state legislature over and over again, this one allows it to go forward. And so the commitment of Ed Code and the, um, 
the Senate bills and the Assembly bills, it really puts in place a system that at this point would be hard to roll back. And so dual enrollment is with us um, for the foreseeable future. Quick uh, comparison, and these again are not the only comparisons, but they're quick comparisons. You can see the difference between dual enrolled CAP classes and non-CAP classes. The one, the articulation one, which we really haven't talked about, um, but Dave Dickey made mention of it last time when he presented. So I think the key point in articulation classes is they are high school courses that mirror the college course. So Dave Dickey, um, Engineering Design Tech, is DT8A at PCC. It's the same course. You take it with Dave or you take it at PCC, it's the exact same course. So when we add, if you guys vote to approve the class he presented last week, that's the third in the series, so it's 8C. Um, and so with those, it's a little bit more difficult. It's not like you're just taking the class. Dave does a lot of work in order to get our kids the college credit for those. Um, we used to have more, and Lisa Kidd was one of the teachers who had, when I first arrived in Temple City, an articulated class. But because our classes aren't truly aligned or truly matching theirs, they, they have that high school flair to them, um, they're no longer articulated. It's not to say they can't be, but at this point, they're not articulated. And then the difference between the two. So we have the non-CAP classes. Um, there has to be a better terminology for these two, like, like CAP and non-CAP. Um, so the non-CAP ones, um, the purpose is for advancement. So when we see our kids taking these classes in the summer, it would be like if a student wanted to take um, German 3. So we don't offer it at the high school, but they would take it there. Or higher level math class, stuff we don't offer at the high school. There are at the very bottom, there's limits. So it's 10% of the physical education classes and 5% of summer enrollment. So the form that I used to sign that Phil now signs, it says right on there that it can't be more than 5% of our students taking classes at a community college at any given time. Um, and then the CAP one, which is the classes we're offering now at the end of the school day, they really are about creating this access for our students um, who are underrepresented. And so as we continue to build our MOU with PCC and continue to get more and more students involved, that then becomes the focus. We all know there's going to be a core group of students who will go off to college, large percent of our students who will go off to college. This is the, our opportunity to get those kids who may not have thought they could, that opportunity to get them there. So who benefits from dual enrollment? Um, across California, and the statistic is pre-pandemic, so it's 18.2%. I mean, you see the, the ethnic breakdown there. Um, what I found curious, or not curious, uh, interesting about this slide is that there isn't a huge disparity across the ethnic group or the racial groups. Um, they're all, it's pretty tight in there. And so the benefit seems to be for all California students. So why do we offer dual enrollment? Um, and I have to take, thank CASBA for this because they quoted the, the, the references in there. So as you look deeper into it, um, the, the references, the authors, the scholarly articles that support these things are all there. But really the three big points are there's expanding access with dual enrollment. There's that transition from high school to college, which is so difficult for some kids. It eases that. And then there's the persistence and completion for our kiddos. Um, college is hard. And so you leave high school and college is not high school anymore. Um, Temple City, where we, we hold our babies tight, college doesn't hold our babies tight anymore. Um, and so across the state, the, the dropout rate or the non-completion rate um, for college students is not what it should be. And so this helps with that. And so the bottom line on our non-CAP classes, the students who they are, it's those ones who want advancement. Um, the what, they take one or more courses, it's college level, um, and they get that experience. And it allows that opportunity for them to experience what they're after. And so I always think of this one as those students who, like our elective base, our higher math class base who don't have the opportunity, this grants them that opportunity. In the summer they can see like, oh, I really wanna take this course, 
they take a course freshman year, then sophomore year, they take the next one, and they move forward that way. The CAP classes, this is the ones we have now. So right now we're offering um, sociology and we're offering speech. And so that is really the start of this. Um, these are those kids who may not be ready for college. They can be, and we're not going to turn kids away, or students away, but it's for those ones who aren't, and that's what the counselors and the site admin will start pushing for. Um, it creates that seamless pathway. So if PCC is our, our partner in this, our kids, the bulk of our kids who go off to PCC, the high school, myself, I know the exec cabinet would like to see our kids have their feet wet beforehand. Like PCC, the first day of their freshman year of college should not be their first time on PCC's campus, nor their first time with PCC credit. Um, and then really, the why they do it is to have those transferable credits, to have that experience, to have the ability to know they can be successful in a college course. Um, and as we continue to build a strong pathway with PCC, this one is more specific about what we're doing now. Um, why do we need this partnership? The one is to meet uh, TCHS goals. We want to increase access. We have career technical education. We want to improve our graduation rate um, and our college career readiness on the dashboard that doesn't exist this year, but will exist next year. Um, and preparing our kids to transfer off to four-year universities once they're done with PCC. Um, it's to build capacity in our students. Those students who think they couldn't go to a university or a college, it's to build that capacity in them saying, yeah, you can. This is your opportunity. It's, it's safe at school, at the high school. They know where the classrooms are. They know the kids sitting next to them. They know if something goes wrong, their counselors are there with them. It's a safe step in. Um, and ultimately, these classes are good for our kids. Like we want them to grow, we want them to experience beyond what our, we're able to offer them. Um, so what is taught? Right now they're gen ed classes. They could be CTE classes, which is career technical education classes. So they're like Dave Dickey's class, they're like Lisa Kidd's class. Um, we could build upon those pathways, build them out. But right now, for the most part, they're general education class. Conversation with Phil and Teresa at the high school um, we're looking at multiple courses and we're looking at pathways within them. So we have sociology now and speech now. The thought is to have sociology too and speech too offered. So these kids have that ability to grow within that line. Um, the staffing. So who supports the program at TCHS? Who supports it at PCC? And then the student supports with the application process. So. I could honestly say at the high school, they've dedicated Teresa, they've dedicated an administrator to this. Um, within the counseling department, we'll see the counselors will be the recommenders about who would benefit mostly from this. The counselors will be the ones who recommend, hey, we think these classes fit what we're hearing our students talk about. PCC has a <coughs> department that does dual enrollment. So Carlos and Raquel, um, they've been amazing. So prior to this, we saw a lot of turnover in that department, um, and it made things difficult. But Carlos has been there since pre-pandemic, and Raquel came, I believe, during the pandemic, and they've been amazing. They've been an amazing support for our students. Um, so much so that last bullet point, they will come to our campus and register our kids. So in order to be dual enrolled, you are truly, officially a PCC student. All the application process, all the IDs, and all this stuff, that you need to do in order to go to PCC, they will come to our kids and do that with us. Um, who will teach the course? And so this one's, this one's, it's tricky because I would love to see our teachers teach it. They know the kids, they, they have the content knowledge. Uh, but the, the rub in all that is in order for our teachers to teach it, they have to have whatever requirements PCC requires to teach the course, and then PCC hires them. And then, um, PCC has its own teachers union and all that goes with that. But again, I'll use Dave Dickey as an example because he's taught at PCC before. If Dave's class was dual enrolled, not articulated, Dave would be able to teach that class, like an after school version of it. Um, and then, so most of our classes are taught by community college instructors. When it's taught, and so this, is, this one is interesting for me. Um, again, I wish Elena was here. Long time ago when German left, 
the high school, we had kids who needed to complete the, the German pathway that they were on. And, and as the program shrank and we wanted to make that commitment to our kids, we'll, we'll support you in this, we brought PCC in. But because PCC's calendar doesn't match ours, we start so late in August and they're starting earlier, the schedule, they, they match like this. Um, and that not matching, it made it difficult for PCC to support it while we were doing it. Um, we made it work. The kids got the credit after school. We also tried it with sports med. In sports med, they didn't even overlay. They were like this, us and them. And so we had to do filler classes. Elena had to sub a class. It was just a nightmare. So as we, we continue to build this partnership, where we start and where we end, those conversations are going to have to be had in order for us to truly merge ourselves with the idea of dual enrollment. Um, the beauty of dual enrollment is the classes are taught on our campus. So we can host them at PCC or whatever college, um, but then they're open to the public. Right now, the classes that we have on our campus, they're closed to us. Only our kids are taking them. So you're not going to have a you know a 35-year-old adult taking speech with our 17-year-old kids. Um, they are close to us. Um, but PCC is flexible, so they, they do offer online and hybrid. Um, I believe that one of the classes now is a hybrid version where there's in-person, but they also do an online component as well. And then finally, the funding. Um, right now under dual enrollment, it's all PCC. Like, they're the ones paying for it. Um, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> like, I'm definitely okay with that. But there is funding sources. And so you see on the, the left side, um, the high school version of it, the, the dual enrollment opportunity grants, the K-12 um, SWP grant. But those three at the bottom, SWP, CPEG, and Perkins, they only re refer to uh, CTE courses. So if we have a CTE pathway that feeds into PCC, then that, it's, that funding could come into play. Um, really though, it's apportionment that PCC is getting. So apportionment is they're able to claim basically ADA like the high school does on those students. As long as it's we're not claiming ADA at the time, they can claim apportionment. And that is it. Is there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, just to clarify, you said that Mr. Dickey's class mm -hmm. mirrors yes. it yes. mirrors PCC's class, uh -huh. but he's not that's not a dual enrollment class though. No, it's not. It's the way he has it set up or the way we have it set up. It's not dual enrolled. Um, it's sort of the, the exact same thing will happen, though. The, the dual enrollment at the end, we have a PCC transcript with a class on it. So Dave's class, because it's articulated, the kids are basically getting credit through their ability to pass. Like, it's a credit through testing. Does that make sense? Yes. So if they go to PCC mm -hmm. after taking his class, mm -hmm. they're going in with credit then? Yes. So right now, so up until today, they have 8A, DT8A, and DT8B. Those are the ones, 8C is the one you guys are going to vote on tonight. So if a student, if Amir goes and he's like, hey, I want to take um, CAD, and he goes, because he hasn't taken Dave Kiki's class yet, he has to start with 8A there. But if we had a student who took engineering design tech with us, they could start 8B there. So the equivalency is there because Dave is teaching, literally teaching PCC's course. Other questions or comments? Um, just one question. Uh, does this build up at some point over time to a situation where a student could get, at the end of their time here at the district, they could have an AA from PCC? Are we going to get to that point at all? Well, I think that's a, a conversation that's worth having. Um, the way the system works now, there's not enough, there's not enough time in order for them to get to all the credit. We could take a large chunk of their their GED courses that they need to take the transferable GED courses that they need to take. That could be done. I don't know if PCC has the capacity yet to order for us to do that. That's really more of the early college model. So if you had an early college model, like Compton has an early college uh, on there, so it's really the college is on the campus. It's accredited college, mm -hmm. and so. 
those kids, every class they take is a dual enrollment class. So that's how they can finish with a, a an AA degree. Oh, okay. uh, it would be far more difficult for us to do that, but uh, the hope would be at least, you know, if we could get to the point where kids have at least a year under their belt, that would be nice. Yeah, yeah I know I know Monrovia has that as well, and so I thought that's what would lead up to it, but that's a good distinction. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, yeah, I do. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Richard, because I, I'm the one who asked for this. I went to that session, and I'm like, wow, this is a lot more confusing than I thought it was, and so thank you for explaining it. Um, so do the um, students at the Learning Center have the opportunity to take these classes, or is it just strictly the high school? So the round we have right now is only our high school. Mm -hmm. Um, the other question I had when I, w I attended the session, um, someone was talking about uh, they had middle school students that went to PCC. They didn't have the classes on the campus, but they they had um, middle stu schools. It was South Amani, and the middle school students went to PCC and took classes. Uh, so. I don't know. Maybe that might be something <laughs> we might want to offer to our students. We have a lot of high achievers, and there might be so kids we, that. We have had middle school students take like a higher level math class. Uh huh. Oh, okay. Uh huh. For me, there's a student, like academically, they can be ready, but all the other stuff that comes with it. So for the non staff classes, I would never want a student to just bring a whole class in the summer. Mm hmm. to think about. All right, any other questions or comments? So thank you so much. Oh, did you want to say something? I, you know, I just wanted to expand on one point. Our goal really is to have, to not add to the workload of, of our students who already participate in so many extracurricular activities. Um, if we can get to the point where we can be duly enrolled during the school day, um, that would be the ideal piece. Thank you. All right, um, moving along to item 22, um, business services, Oak Avenue Intermediate Safety and Access Control. Anthony Salazar. Thank you, Board President Giorgino, <clears throat> members of the board, Dr. Kuna and Executive Cabinet. Um, tonight, I'd like to discuss or further um, our further our discussion on safety um, and access control, um, specifically at Oak Avenue. Um, so, <clears throat> if we do a little recap, back on November 9th, the board um, approved the relocation of the staff lot gate in order to aid in the safety measure, and not only that, as uh, Mr. Lessam and I presented also affect the safety by adding our campus supervisors into the campus versus um, manning a gate all day. Um, here's a few slides from that presentation. Um, <clears throat> further discussions have ha been had with um, admin um, and other stakeholders at the site to see how can we implement more access control, hardening our sites, and, and really um, locking this site down um, from the public and really protecting the kids. So phase two would include tackling our admin building. Um, this picture, you can tell here, uh, since we were able to add a new marquee with the help of PTA, um, Maria Gardner's done, thank you for that. Um, we've already pushed that gate back a few feet um, into the campus. Phase two would incorporate a, a, a few pieces of hardware and software, which I've been working with um, IT on, um, as well as our 
um, electrician and visiting other school districts that have this implemented in them and seeing the pros and cons. Currently, these are what our um, admin phone system looks like and what we would be implementing would be a keypad or a two-way device um, on the exterior of the building allowing us to lock down that office building. Um, currently, all of the elementary schools, you need to come in through an office building and that office door stays jarred open throughout the day. Throughout, throughout school hours, that's your entry point. Um, adding this on the exterior of the building will allow us to not only have all of our gates locked, but remain have our office door locked, um, allowing access once a visitor walks on campus, buzzes in, and allows us a two-way communication as well as video um, to kind of pre-check whatever visitor is, is uh, accessing our sites. Phase two would look at looking at um, the current Oak Avenue office building. Um, the windows on the left are the work room build, uh, office. We would look at converting that into a double door and converting that work room into a reception area. Um, adding a gate in between the newly converted doors and the existing doors and, and, and really blocking off that area, forcing every visitor during school hours through the office before they get into our campus. Um, I know it was a big concern to Dr. Kuna when, um, as he came back with Oak Avenue being wide open. As soon as you come in through that gate, you have access to the whole site. Um, currently, Mr. Lessam has combated that with having his staff come out and meet people at the gate every time they come in. We have electrified that gate, giving them the option to buzz from their desk, but they have no communication from the street level to the office. Um, this would combat that. You would come directly into the office uh, without any way of getting into campus, and then if you needed to continue on to into campus, then you would come out the existing or, or the old double doors. Um, we've had numerous conversations with admin, um, ILT staff meetings um, to kind of get input on not disrupting um, daily operations, but the end goal of securing our sites. Um, we are rolling this into the uh, gate and relocation of that gate and kind of tying all of the sight lines together. So this will depict um, the wrought iron getting pushed back to match where our rolling gate is going to be installed now. Um, aligning that with our building and the proposed front entrance and gate um, is in the red dot signifies where our uh, current fencing is now. So phase one, we've already come, um, started that process. We are awaiting our gates to be powder coated. We should be done in about two to three weeks. Phase two can be done um, simultaneously. We, we can do a lot of this without disrupting school, um, which would be adding a lot of that fence work, which we can do in-house, um, which makes it able for us to do a lot of this work during school hours and not have to wait for a break. Um, redesigning of the bike rack. Um, and moving that location to an kind of an area of campus that's not being used, which is just south of the 500 building. Um, and in closing that area, which is turf now, um, I know Connie will be happy about this, but it'll reduce watering costs as we won't have to water that area anymore. It'll just be asphalt and converting that whole area into a bike rack. What this also allows is for us to really open up the front of the campus. Um, I know I take a lot of pride in our schools when you come up to them and they're pretty inviting. Right? We don't have fences everywhere, yet our campuses are, are still secure. If you pull up to Clover, you see the admin building and that site is secure. You pull up to Longden, you can see the admin building. Emperor, you see admin building. Currently at Oak, you see fencing. Um, and trying to change that look to be able to secure that site, yet present that site to the community. Um, and this kind of will allow, allow us to accomplish that. So here's an aerial view of not only where the gates would be placed, you can see where the bike rack would be moved to, where I just uh, explained south of that building, but this also opens us up um, to future talks um, of a drive, a circle drive, and a new apron. Um, I've been in contact with the city, um, 
with uh, getting those conversations started with traffic control um, and implementation of, of this um, phase of the project. Um, <clears throat> and everybody that goes up and down Oak Avenue right at the beginning of the school knows how much congestion there is. Um, this would really help ease a lot of that congestion during during that pickup and drop off time. Um, and, and again, it really goes back to allowing us to secure these campus, locking them down, giving one, hardening our campuses and giving one entry point, um, as well as beautifying it by opening up to the front of it so you can see the buildings, you can see um, the murals painted um, up on the buildings, right, um, without being met by uh, wrought iron. Any questions? Can I add really one thing before you ask? Um, along the same lines of, of the congestion on Oak, one of the things that we're also trying to get away from is having parents drop off their students from the street and running across the street. So hopefully if we put in a circle drive, parents will use the circle drive to, to actually drop their students off and, and I always worry about the fact that, you know, somebody, is, there's going to be an accident, you know, one day with a kid trying to run across the street. There's so many cars out there. And so these are just some of the things that we've been thinking about. Um, we know that it takes away a lot of the grass in the front of that school. Um, and one of the things that I had asked Anthony to do, and he did, was go and talk to the site because it's a, it's a big change for them. Uh, everybody is very used to that really large green space uh, in front of Oak, but um, I, in, in talking with the, the staff, they realized that there's a need for safety too. And so it, it, times have changed. Uh, we love the green space, but we do have to make sure the schools are safer for kids and, and that we, are, we have the ability to restrict access when needed. So uh, just wanted to throw those things out there. Sorry, Nancy. Oh, no, that's okay. I, I wanted to see that slide because the part that I don't understand is, so the red dotted line is where the new fencing would be. It stops at the end of the green. Does it, well, does it stop at the end of the green? Because I'm trying to figure out how is it still secured from the reception area? Like, where, what's blocking somebody from going down that, that aisle way there along the, uh, parallel to the administrative building? So, the so the first two panels is probably what we would have to rod iron there. So that red dotted line of the new fence would go to that first post. Okay. And then we would be able to secure those first two sections, and then there would be a gate in between those two curved uh, okay. windows. Okay. 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 Right. And that gate um, would now not allow you access to the site and force you into the into door. the reception area. Got it. Okay. That's thank you. Um, if I can add a little bit to Dr. Kuna was mentioning about that green space, um, it does look like it's taking up a lot. When you are on the site and when you are actually standing on that area, it is it, it really isn't too much, and we still have so much remaining. Um, I know I was just speaking to to uh, Jack Taylor about he puts on a phenomenal performance at the end of the year. We would be able to still have those activities because if we wouldn't interrupt that green space that be, is, is being used for those performances. Um, this gives you a good idea of the dim, of like dimension wise. Um, from say a perspective circle driveway to the new gate is only 12 feet. That's from me to you. That's what would be grass, grass uh, green space that, that we would kind of eat up um, along with some of that driveway. But it's not, it's, it, it really isn't too much. Would we lose any trees? From the onset, I don't think we would touch the big um, tree that's there now. Mm -hmm. And I, the one that's in the corner that's really hard to see in the shaded by the bike rack, I think both of those would be able to be saved. I've been kind of going back and forth. This, um, I'd like to thank a uh, little diversified architect who drew this up. Um, when I was speaking with the site on, on these proposed changes, um, I was in touch with that uh, architectural group who proposed a very similar idea years ago. Um, and this is, it, it was very 
um, refreshing to know a lot of the concerns that we would like to change now. We've already started having these conversations. It's just finishing now. Um, when the drive through comes out, I know there's a stop sign right where that driveway is, right? Right. Okay. Would there be congestion of people coming out of there and parents stopping out in the street? That would be something that we'd have to talk with the city on. We, we have spoke about that of where it lets off. It doesn't let off right at the stop sign. It's right before it. Okay. So that would be something that uh, the traffic control study would kind of tackle and, and guide us on what, um, where we would have to exit out onto the street. Um, we were hoping to, to make as long of a circle driveway as possible, but we would have to partner with, with the city and traffic control on, on how we actually implement it. Okay, well, thank you so much. We look forward to getting an update on that. Next is item 23. This is a discussion action item, uh, educational services. Approval of the new course, Advanced STEAM Elective at Oak Avenue Intermediate School. So this was the class that was presented last week by, or last meeting by Mr. Sitter and by Jordan. And so it's the, it's the STEAM class, the second set of, our second leg of the STEAM class. Okay, great. Does anyone have any questions? All right, would someone like to make a motion? Um, um, motion by mem Member Sneed, and I'm sorry, who was second, that? Second, Melissa. Okay, uh, second by Member Espinosa. Um, student Board Member King? Yes. And all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries 5 0. We've got a new course. <laughs> Item 24 is approval of new mathematics course at Temple City High School, Financial Algebra, Advanced Algebra with Financial Applications. So moved. Um, you want to wait and see if you have, do you have something to tell us? <laughs> so no, this is, this is for us, we did the presentation for us uh, at yeah. the last meeting. Okay. Three, three, so we're here. And so it's the Financial Algebra class that fulfills that. Okay, great. Okay, I'm sorry. So, who made the motion? Yeah. Member Smith. And who seconded? King. Uh, okay, student board member King. Okay, any final questions or comments? Really quick, I did have some questions from a couple of constituents, and I just want to make sure that it's um, here. Um, so, this course does count as another acceptable math course for UCs. Is that right? Okay, A through CG. And then, um, is this kind of course being like um, held, uh, offered at like other schools, or is this something very, very new? So I wouldn't say it's offered widespread, but I would it's offered at other schools. And so um, normally, when you go through A through G, you look for other schools that have it. So you're not reinventing the wheel. And, and Flo was able to do that, and the textbooks and stuff um, were there, and so she is able to, to view it and use this as my course. You know? And so yeah. And then the last one, is there like a teacher that they already have in mind to do this course? I think they're still working that out with the master schedule. Um, Flo, who did a long leg work, would love to do it, but I don't know if she's going to do it. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, any other questions or comments? All right, we'll go ahead and vote. Student Board Member King? Yes. And all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries 5-0. Item 25 is approval of another new course at Temple City High School, Advanced Systems Design and Fabrication. Okay. You just had to jump right in there, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll have you. And you seconded? Okay. All right, so that was motion by Member Bell, second by uh, Student Board Member King, and... Uh, Okay. So, you know, I will say even though the first two set of it may not have necessarily counted 
as far as college credit uh-huh. path, it actually still helps tremendously. Because like I said, my daughter hadn't taken those courses. Uh, and, uh, you know, as part of her uh, graduation uh, requirements uh, for her mechanical engineering degree, she does need to take a similar course. But having that knowledge of it allows her free her time to focus on other areas like in mathematics. So it's still super helpful. Well, there's also our TV yeah. courses where our kids walk away having completed it. They walk away with those courses. So whether it's a certificate or the knowledge that they go through it, have a kid do it is not a big task. Okay, any other comments or questions? All right, we'll go ahead and vote. Uh, student Board Member King? Yes. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries, 5-0. Move on to the consent calendar. Would someone like to make a motion? A motion. I'll motion, second. motion by Member Espinosa, second by Member Smith. Um, did anybody have any questions or comments on this? Okay. Uh, student Board Member King? Yes. And all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries 5 0. Next is board comments. And I know um, Member Bell has something he'd like to say, so you can go first. I do. Um, <laughs> so my apologies. I completely forgot about this earlier. We talked extensively about chronic pregnancy and fertility mainly. makes me super happy. But at the same time, I sometimes forget things. So uh, this past Saturday, I um, was hanging out with Oak Avenue and Longden um, because they competed uh, down in uh, Irvine. And I want to say they did an outstanding job, um, and I want to give a big thanks to both um, Karen Shea and Samantha Chang for keeping long the science of looking at program alive through all these years. They finished fourth overall. The kids had a great time. Oh, yay. Even more challenging is the fact that they do have two teams now, which is a daunting task. Um, just having to work with 34 different kids and having them completely organized their tent area was basically a city, and I lost track of how many tents they had, at least eight. So it just shows the parent participation was tremendous. Um, and, you know, Oak Avenue, I'm really proud of them. Um, and again, to uh, Marlies Reyna, Winnie Joe, for keeping that program going through all these years and um, giving these kids that opportunity. I worked with some of their build teams, you know, I'm glad to say that their flight team came in second. Bridged in like 15. Um, I think both teams are, are flourishing and they're doing it really well. And I just want to thank the staff and Pete Mark for getting here. You were there on that day on Saturday and I forgot to thank you. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So again, that's it. Thank you. So okay. Much. Thank you. Any other board comments? Okay, we'll move on to item 31, which is future agenda items. And um, does anybody have any? Okay, we'll, we'll move on to item 32, which is additional public comment on agendized and non-agendized items. Does anyone have any comments they'd like to make? Okay, we'll move on to adjournment. Uh, yes, just waiting. Can, <laughs> can I get a motion to adjourn? A motion. Motion by Member Espinosa. Second. Second by Member Sneed. Um, student Board Member King? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 5 0.